Coming in to you guys live on YouTube. All right, let's make sure the ad kicks in. That's like a good sign is when the, the opening morning show ad starts. And then I know that the, there it goes. All right, everybody, welcome yeah. back to another morning of Good Morning Kiev. I'm Andy Mercado, and I have a very special guest this morning, Terrell Star. Hey, what's up, boss? Super, super, super amazing to have you, bro. Super, super amazing. Before you guys uh, could please like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, go and support Terrell on X. His uh, link is in the description to follow him on all of his social media. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Terrell, it was a pleasure so much, sir. Go ahead and introduce yourself uh, and what you're doing for Ukraine to any viewers that might not know who you are. Yeah, yeah of course. I'm Terrell Star. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I got my yeah, mic. Yeah. I, hope, I hope everybody hears me, but I'm Terrell Jermaine Star. I am an independent journalist. And I produce content for YouTube. My new YouTube channel will be launching next week. Um, Black Diplomats uh, you, um, YouTube channel. And I also will be launching my newsletter, uh, also Black Diplomats. So I am an independent journalist. I also am an analyst. So I do a lot of work dealing with the intersection of Ukrainian and U.S. relations. Mm. And I also am uh, here just basically working as an advocate um very biased towards you you know about ukraine yeah, 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 yeah. And, and supporting ukraine so when i'm not here i'm in the states and i'm participating uh, going to washington talking to lawmakers about ways in which they can support ukraine but just also giving them the experience of what it's like being on the ground here yeah yeah what got you interested in starting independent journalism oh so look i i am i became a journalist when i was 25 years old so i first started off with uh, peace. I, I went to Russia, boo, right? And when I was in, uh, <laughs> I was 20 years old in undergrad. Then what was interesting was that after I left that summer experience, it was the summer before my senior year, I said, okay, I want to go back to Russia. And then the Rus this is 2001. Yeah, yeah. And in 2002, Russia closed out their program for Peace Corps. And so my that the administrators at Peace Corps said okay well can't send you there where can we send you mm -hmm. so we would I ended up going to Georgia Sarkot Vela oh the wow country, okay, right? okay and so I'm Golly. telling you all that because it was a transformative experience yeah, yeah. right and so I spent more than two years in Georgia as a Peace Corps volunteer there during the orange during the Rose Revolution yeah right. the Orange Revolution took place a few months later over here um in 2000 yes yeah, 2003 2004 Four. period and 2004 yeah and so I from then, after I finished Peace Corps, I said, what, what should I do with this experience? I want to tell stories. So I picked journalism as a way to share stories. So I was in grad school, started with the student newspaper, 20, mm. 25 years, well, 26 years old, 25, 26 years old with students who are 18, 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then I eventually went on to do NPR and stuff like that. And, and, and just it went on from there. Is there a certain topic that you focus on with your journalism, or is it just wherever you go, what you'll put your mind to? Yeah, so right now, I basically focus on what life is like here during the war, mm. but not necessarily. I, I deal with the military stuff, but more specifically, I go and just talk to people. So I, I, I go to a desk, I, I, you know, all parts of Ukraine, and just go to cafe, talk, talk with cafe owners. Um, I may find one subject, and they take me around their town wow. for a few days and I just write about them. Wow. Because, yeah, because that's the whole thing, right? Yeah. So I feel like, you know, you do the work that you do there. So, but, you know, you think about the, what's missing in the larger media net, um, landscape and it's uh, CNN, New York Times, all these big networks have the military stuff covered yeah. well. And they're able to go into these areas with armed yeah guards and all this other stuff i mean i don't have all that but what i do have is access to the people and this passion of filling in that gap right because we understand the military elements of it but we don't quite a day life is for people when it's not about shooting mm -hmm. it's not about missiles not about drones so that's the work that i do specifically wow and it's so huge bro because you're right because it, it's it weighs on me when I'm when I'm covering when I'm aggregating at night yeah. and just going through the latest and combat videos come up and it's like, I mean yeah, I get I get that and people need to see that but also coming here and talking to people is just so powerful. It's a different you know I'll tell yeah, you yeah, I don't yeah. know like for me, I I, I came here in two thousand and eight. Wow. Yeah. Started right then I did my Fulbright, so I was here living here for a year and a half, 
but now I live here um, right now um, as well. So I was here at the beginning of the war. So I will say I would spend at least six months out of my year here in Ukraine, yeah, at, at least. least, at least, right? And yeah, yeah. so, and when I leave here, it feels different. Mm. And so I think, so that's one of the reasons why I decided I, to, to stay here is because I feel like we can go home to the States yeah. with this very immersive kind of outlook mm -hmm. about what it's like to be here from day to day. So we don't share, we don't have news clip stories to share with people. And there's just a monotony of going days without hearing the siren, for example. Yeah, yeah. And then also the fact, you know, this is a very lively city. We're in the heart of downtown and people don't think that this exists. Mm. Of course, you know, yesterday we had that, what I call a terrorist attack that happened um, where, you know, six, at, least six, at least 60 people were killed in, a, in an unprovoked attack during a, uh, a funeral, I think. And, and, and so you definitely have that. But then you also have <clears throat> places like Kiev where a lot of the businesses are open generally. Mm -hmm and things are pretty much running like it would be in any major city in the United States. Have you been all around Ukraine since you've been here now yeah. at this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been, so I'm north, south, east, west, I've been everywhere. There's not, <laughs> there, there's not a part of Ukraine that I've been to. Now, northwest Ukraine, mm. that's one of the places where I really have not spent an extensive amount of time. Yeah. But as far as the Carpathians, the south, oh, lucky. the east, I've been everywhere, but northwest, isn't. And so that's what I'm doing with my YouTube channel. Yeah. So every so so every week I'm going to be showing people video of my travels around the country. And so just to give you all a sneak peek, next week I next week there's going to be a video uh, that I'm going to show of me in in a town called Yehitnia. Okay. And which is in Chernihiv, which is in which is in the north, which is in the, yeah, north, uh, yeah. is in the north. And so. I'm, you know, I went to a town that was called, that, that was uh, occupied by the Russians, mm -hmm. and so uh, just showing you the work that volunteers are doing to rebuild it, and it's just a couple of days, just one full day of me just hanging around that town with That's volunteers. So, cool, so yeah, it's that thing. And then the following one is going to be of me going around uh, the city of Zaporizhia. Okay. And you're, I'll, you're, I'll be showing you all. What life is like there because everyone knows about the nuclear power plant that's roughly an hour away from the city because everyone there's Zaporizhia the city and Zaporizhia you know the uh the oblast right and so I am so I'm doing that type of work and I but I I want to show people I, this is a really dope place and I I you know before I before the war started I wanted to start a tourism business yeah yeah and take people around and so I still want to do that, but until wow. that happens, everyone's going to get that YouTube channel, which is called Black Diplomats. It's going to launch next week, and you'll start seeing these videos. And uh, what we'll do too next week is I'll go and edit this stream and add your YouTube channel link. Uh, yeah, because thanks. people people will watch this like weeks in advance. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that way, yeah, that, so yeah, if you're I watching this in a week from now, the channel link isn't there, but it'll be there as soon, so they can they can find that. Yeah. The, we have a massive Ukraine support community, so they'd love to see that type of content. Like they love that. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm looking forward to sharing that with y'all because I feel like there is there's so many gaps and coverage that we could show people Hell yeah. about this country. Yeah. And I think that my my YouTube channel, in addition to my YouTube, in, in addition to my uh, Substack newsletter that I'm going to that's, that's going to be launching is. You know, this is a very, I don't think people realize how big this country is and how complex it is. And I, people learned about me during the war mm. at the very beginning. And so both of these platforms with the newsletter and, and YouTube, I'm going back really to the roots of how people came to know me which is by being with the people. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. Yeah, in fact, speaking on our own experience with my viewers, we yeah. found you early, like, early days last year and you were just talking to people and keeping it simple, but like, it was as real as hell because we, we couldn't trust the, the mainstream news all the time because they had a live camera, but they weren't like on the ground talking to people. What do you find um, that, that uh, with talking to people directly provides your journalism? So, you know, that's a very good question. 
I started off in, in, in black media. Yeah. And, and you know, African-American media. And so I worked, my first job was with a, uh, a, 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 um, a news organization, it's Radio One. And there are a lot of people who, who are really aware of this black owned radio station yeah. that expanded into digital and television. And so I come from this black journalism tradition where there's there's activism involved in it. And so you can't, you know, the history of black America and, and the history that we have and uh, that you're really rare, well, well aware of um, coming back to the days where black media, uh, in addition to covering uh, current events actually had to advocate for their own people because no, you know, no one else would. And so I come from that spirit. So I was mm. never mainstream. So I never worked in a mainstream mm. newsroom. So I was never like welded to yeah. these traditional mainstream rules. And so the advocacy that you see for me is the same way that I work with my own community. Mm. That's the whole thing. So the way that I talk about Ukraine is the same way that I report about my community with care, yep. right? Because I don't pretend, I pre I, I'm fair. Yep. So you're gonna know where I'm coming from. And you know, I'm professionally trained. I went to University of Illinois, graduate school, got my master's degree. My Fulbright focused on journalism here. And I worked at, you know, started off with, with, with national public radio, right? But, yeah. but, but much of my career was based on this spirit of using journalism to really talk with people in ways that aren't really stilted, mm. talk to you know, and, and and not being afraid just to do common stuff. Mm. So when last year, <laughs> I was amazed that I got hundreds of thousands of views mm. at the beginning of the war, just simply walking around yeah. with my with my camera, like with my selfie stick, just showing people grocery shopping, mm. and. I was really shocked. I'm like, okay, guys, I'm going to go to this clinic, and these are the lines. People were eating it up. Wow. You know, yeah. or, or when I was at checkpoints, mm -hmm. and when I was helping people to leave, you know, and, yeah. there, and, and what's interesting, there are a lot of photos and video that I even haven't, pre, um, haven't really shared yet, because, you know, I'm working on, um, you know, I'm looking to create other pieces of content with it, but... I really, I think ultimately why I do it is because I, I think people like seeing the humanity in journalists and seeing them care, yeah. right? That's yeah. the main thing. So I don't pretend to be objective. Mm. And I was really passionate about it. And because I cared and people saw my passion, that made everybody else care. Yeah. And that's, and to me, that is the way that I love to use journalism. Mm. I want people to care about each other. I don't want to live in a world where you're in your silo, I'm, I'm in my silo, because you cover the George Floyd protests. You know, that's how you started this YouTube channel, yeah. right? And I think we really need to, all of us as human beings need to model what it looks like to give a damn about somebody who doesn't come from your community, yeah. who doesn't come from your background. Because I think that that is what it takes for us to live in the community together. And I'm just really proud that my journalism reflects that. What are some of the similarities and differences uh, between covering Ukraine and covering um, uh, African-American mm -hmm. community with your journalism? Oh, that's, a good, that's another great question. So one of the similarities I see is misunderstandings, mm. right? Very the complexities. So. One of the things that we saw during the uh, Mike Brown, mm. Mike Brown uh, was really in America, the cornerstone of how I believe America stopped, you know, changed the ways that they cover black people. Mm -hmm. and, and the primary reason is that we use our cell phones and we, you know, the Constitution determines our ability to, to capture media, right? Because journalism, the job, historically was based on where you worked, mm. right? And so, but in reality, Americans, we, have, we all have a constitutional right to create media. And what protesters did during the killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson in 2014 
was they claimed that power and I don't care they weren't necessarily trained to be journalists. What I do care about was that they used that constitutional right to tell a story and that forced mainstream media to adjust. Mm -hmm. and, and, what I, and I think what I saw in mainstream media coverage was there's a, you know, black people, we have a lot of complexities. We have a lot of people, like just certain figures in our community that may be controversial, but because of the history in our country, mm -hmm. they require nuance. I see. Right. So, so, I see so, let, so, so let's get back to see, Ukraine. So let's get back to Ukraine, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Azov. Let's talk about Stefan Bandera. Let's talk about all these things. You know, this whole thing about Ukrainian Nazis, that bullshit. Um, because I lived in Ukraine, and particularly, you know, being a black person, right? Yep. I could tell you about racism, which is everywhere, right? I could tell you, you know, and as somebody who covers race professionally, right? Yeah. Um, because just because you're black doesn't mean you know black, doesn't mean you know race, any of those things, right? But I cover it professionally. And so when these issues come up in Ukraine, I'm able to critically report on it, but also have the nuance to understand the cultural contexts, right? About why you, why, you know, about, about Azov, right? About the step armor there, which is, you know, the history is history, but it's extremely complex. But the reason, the similarities is that because, a, just because a subject is difficult, doesn't mean that you shouldn't cover it, mm. right? And doesn't mean that it doesn't have nuance. I believe that there's more gray to a lot of us than black and white, you know? And because I have seen my community covered and, 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 and I've seen mainstream media get it wrong with my community for so long, I bring that same sensitivity to Ukraine. And I've seen people inaccurately cover Ukraine. So just talk about, for example, one of my major projects deals with the racism that African students and people of color face leaving Ukraine, right? So we can have a conversation mm -hmm. about that, right? I have no problem having a conversation about the fa fact that when they went to the border, they experienced it here, they experienced it when they went to the European Union. I've been documenting these stories over the course of a year. It's absolutely true. What's also true is that we can't just label this country as a racist country, racist society, and just say that this is the ground zero of European racism. That would be inaccurate, mm. right? You know, and, and what I also do in my reporting is that I also show activists and, and Ukrainians who are also pushing back against it, mm. right? And so. I have no problem dealing with racism. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with people being stereotyped. Mm -hmm. And my community has been stereotyped. And so just like my people need nuance, Ukrainian people, the country deserves the same respect. What are some of the challenges you faced in uh, weighing the balance between the two? The main thing is your work is not gonna always make people happy. Yeah, 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 <laughs> that, that, that's the main thing, yeah. right? So I. I even when you do the best job you possibly can. Because I'm even with this project, you know, where I'm dealing with the, the, the black refugees who fled, I put a lot of painstaking hours dealing, you know, working with Ukrainians, dealing with Ukrainian experts, right, to to make sure that this project, which is going to be released next you know, the end of the end of um, winter next year, mm. you know, early spring. You're not, you're doing a project? Yeah, uh, it's called Fleeing Ukraine While Black. Okay, so yeah. you you have a you have a whole piece on this. Yes, yes, I have a whole yes, yeah, a whole it's fleeing Ukraine while and black. When is it dropping? Oh, it's going to drop in this you know uh, late winter, early spring. So it'll, it'll be around March, April, right? Roughly Dope. around that time. Dope. But, but yeah, Anyways. so it's video and audio documentaries, and so I've traveled around Europe. I'm here in Ukraine, dealing with black Ukrainians, African students, etc. But the difficulty is. Everybody is, even your best efforts, everybody's not going to be satisfied for your work. And, you know, you have to deal with people saying, well, you're an outsider, you don't know, which is true. I'm not Ukrainian, but, you know, I do understand that this is a global issue, mm. right? And so when this whole thing happened, it, it, it's not just about Ukraine, it's become this global issue because, it, you know, these, these situations this happened in Ukraine, it happened in Germany, it happened in France happened across the continent and 
what what's striking this balance is is tough because a lot of the people that I've interviewed, mm. uh, some of them are afraid to speak because they don't want to be real. They they're afraid of the backlash. Um, so you're dealing with a lot of societal issues within Ukraine. You're dealing with a lot of interpersonal issues with the people that you're speaking to because this, this there's you're dealing with war trauma. Yeah. You're dealing, you know. So the one element of it, you have. Uh, domestic issues at home with women. You're dealing with people who have been abused under Russian occupation. You have people who are dealing with the constant threat of dr missile strikes and drone strikes. And so you have a multitude of traumas, PTSD. And one of them is it, with, with a small group of people who are rarely talked about is racism. Mm. And this country has not had a real comprehensive conversation about um, diversity in a meaningful way because there are just not enough people here who are who are, who are experts in minorities who've been empowered to actually talk mm -hmm. about it right and so and, and so where do I stand and where do I strike this balance the best that I can and it's ultimately not going to be and, and, and it's and you're going to do the best you can and you're still going to run into people who will be critiquing which is fair but what I look to do is I make sure that I'm as honest and transparent about the work that I do as possible. And I'm confident that, you know, people will still respect me because I've spent so much time yeah. working, busting my ass to support this country that this should just be one of those projects that come along with it that will be provoking. And I'm confident that it will be constructive. Hell yeah, I'm, ex I'm excited to check that out Thanks. too as yeah. well. Uh, what, what are it? these comments? I'm, so, I know, I'm sorry, I'm oh, sorry yeah, to yeah, be yeah. your host. No, I'm, just, I'm just curious because it's not showing up on my... Yeah, uh, Trell is right, Trauma, they, they're agreeing with you so far. And what I'm seeing, they're coming through. If you guys have any questions for... 100 Trell. If you guys have any questions for Trell, this is an interactive stream, so you can ask him questions. Just at me in the chat to get my attention, um, and then I can ask him. Yeah, I would so, love to talk yeah, to y'all. Yeah, hey, yeah, and yeah. by the way, I want to thank everybody uh, just briefly. It's like I really appreciate everybody's support and and really tuning in because, you know, we both are here. You know, we, we, we come from the States, man. Like, we're both Midwest. I know uh, I say I'm Brooklyn, but I, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. So we're both Midwest yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And, and, um, and so I think it takes – I just want to thank you, man, for, for doing this. Because, because I think it takes a special person to come over here and and just say we're just gonna live here yeah. you know like yeah, 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 yeah. no seriously man it takes a special <laughs> individual to say i'm gonna come over because you're doing you you're, you know the napo yeah people and i think you're one you're like the one of the first people i've actually met really you know? yeah i mean like as far as having a real yeah, i put yeah, it yeah. like this like i think that i talk to a lot of people but they may not say NAFO, right. but as far as sitting down, talking with you, yeah, yeah. first one, I think it's pretty cool. So, man, you do dope stuff yourself, man. I appreciate that, bro. Of course. Oh, yeah, we got to keep going. It takes, I think it takes everybody, whatever we can do. You know what I mean? Whatever power that we got, you got to use it. And you're doing, the, I mean, and that's the whole thing, man. Like, going to these front line places, dropping off cars and, 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 and supplies, they need it. And, and I think, I, I, and by the way, I, I'm really troubled about what's going on with our politics. Bro, we're going to get into that, too. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. Because, because, man, um, you, and you see Jim Jordan, that, yeah, yeah, oh, Jesus Christ, right? Because you know what's interesting? I used to cover, I covered U.S. politics, like, as far as being a beat reporter. Yeah, yeah. So I covered 2016 to 2020. So I was on the road Dang. going from one little country town to the next and covering presidential elections. So I know this stuff very well. I'm going to be covering it this time, but I'll be based here and focusing on Ukraine. But I used to be on the road Dang, and bro. covering these guys. So I pretty much understand how this process works. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of the biggest optimists in the world. But as far as this House Speaker situation, Ukraine's in trouble. What are the biggest challenges you have? Now, you talked about just like being a journalist in the two communities. But what about taking the message that you're learning here home to Americans? What are the challenges with that and explaining the situation here? Because America doesn't do a really good job of explaining what foreign policy means to us as mm. people. That's the fundamental problem. So if I were to ask you all, what is foreign policy? 
I do this all the time with my podcast and I talk about foreign relations. We don't, what is foreign policy, guys? What does it mean to you? Okay, I'm going to give you the answer that I tell everybody else. Foreign policy, the way I think that we should be looking at it, how do you want your world to live? How do you mm. want your world to be governed? What type of rules and what types of structures do you think ought to exist? I look at foreign policy the same way that I look at urban planning. Mm. Think about it, Brian Key. Somebody in City Hall decided that these houses need to be here, this street needed to be mapped out in this way, these, uh, these, these uh, stores need to be here, mm -hmm. there, this park needs to be here. Um, when you think about the American context, I'll give you an example of my hometown of uh, Detroit, Michigan. So, my, a lot of black people came up uh, from the South. Most, most, much of the black population comes from the American South slavery. You all know that history. And when these migrations happened, black people were partitioned into particular parts of communities, right? Detroit, large cities like New York, where my father's from, no, no different. And a lot of our projects in public housing uh, where black people exist, that was planned. That's urban planning. And so there are people, and they're usually white men, who decided this is where not only these buildings will be, this is where these particular group of people mm. will be. Foreign policy is no different, mm. okay? And, and, and particularly when you're dealing with world politics, when you think about Israel, Palestine, all these people, when you look at, when, you know, when you, when you look at countries, the, in the, it's usually the people who have the most power that decides how our country is carved up. Mm -hmm. And who politically has access to them in their in their in their national resource national resources? So, bringing it on home, mm -hmm. all home, it's you know, we don't ask the American people what type of foreign policy should America be producing because America is one of those urban planners, but on the foreign policy perspective, we could do that for good, we could do it for bad. And unfortunately, in our history, we've done a lot of bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and, and, and we could do a lot of. But the question is, uh, we could do a lot of good. And then going back yeah. to Ukraine, it's what does security mean to you? So when we think about never again, right? Yeah. When you think about uh, when you, when you think about the atrocities that took place in the world, we say, why did this happen? This is an opportunity for America to really be asked, and for Biden to really translate to the world. Do you want to stop a genocide? We have an opportunity to do that because what's happening here is, is a genocide. And, and Putin has made it very clear that he wants to literally get rid of the Ukrainian people. His henchmen on, national, you know, on Russian state television have said this. And so to the American public, do you want to live in a world where one power can come in and just completely... Um, de declare that they want to wipe out the country and you stand around and let them do it. Do we want to live in a country where we can elite, where us in America can illegally invade other countries? Is that acceptable to you? So we have an opportunity to really change course, right? And, and that needs to be trans, that needs to be communicated to us. And we don't do that because we have these big oceans that divide us. Yeah. We don't, we have friendly countries to the north and to the south. And so we don't worry about our security in the way that a country like Ukraine does or even, you know, continental Europe, yeah. et cetera. Right. And so we but we're not we're not we're not spoken to in that matter. And Biden doesn't do a really good job of communicating, which, in my view, I think the man has done a pretty remarkable job. But I think that he doesn't communicate his messaging, and even on domestic issues. Mm. Now, one now Republicans do a damn good job of communicating their stuff. Yeah. They do. I, I they think do, they they're, do. they're exceptionally good with messaging. They can get to their base. They can get to and, and they do it incredibly yeah, yeah, yeah. well. Yep. I don't agree with the crap that they talk about. But, <laughs> right, right, but, but, but the thing is, they're very yep. good at it. And the only person on the Democratic side that really does a great job of that in any, on any real national scale that has any resonance is, is Galvin Newsom mm -hmm. out of California. I think he does an incredible job. Um, and... and it's unfortunate that at the White House level we don't do that, but we need some of that Galvin Newsom type of, of, of messaging when it comes to foreign policy, 
on Ukraine. And then when we start being communicated with, at, with about our role as Americans being as influential, uh, being as important a subject as the, 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 the kitchen table subjects, yep. then I think that we'll be, be uh, on a better course to really making this world a better place and, and also making our politicians accountable to Ukraine. How do you take this message to those that are in America that will say, America first, uh, what foreign policy? We shouldn't have any foreign policy. We should just focus on our own country. What do you say to these people? Number one, they don't know how budgets work. Mm -hmm. So what I find really utter, utterly ridiculous, and I say this as somebody who's a journalist, and I cover military budgets. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if any of you are uh, accountants or who have to look at budget on a daily basis. I'm not, I don't have accounting training or anything like that, but I just found it painstakingly boring, but I appreciate it now. Um, because I think something like less than 4% of our defense budget yeah. is coming to Ukraine, right? Which is an infinitesimal, like a really small amount. And the, the fundamental problem, and I, I, slightly in the weeds, so forgive me, but I think it's important, is that you know, people think that it's a resource issue or a scarcity issue when it comes to America, for America first, which I think is white supremacist language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it is. is. It, it is. is. <laughs> okay. You know, <laughs> historically, but it, yeah. historically, it's, it's, it's yeah. white supremacist language, or you yeah. know, um, but but basically, we don't have a resource problem. We have an allocation. Mm. issue right and there's a difference so what i find interesting is uh when we talk about spending you know we had this conversation during covid mm. and it's not like america does not have the resources to take care of its people we do we have a we we, we have an allocation issue but we also have a moral issue that's the primary thing um there are people, there's a caucus and, 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 you know, on, on, on Capitol Hill right now, and, you know, Senate, yeah. Senate senators and, 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 um, and representatives that are talking about a 10% uh, a cut in the uh, Pentagon and Pentagon spending. Now, 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 here's the thing. Now, check this out. It's not as bad as you think. Okay. It's not as bad as you think. The problem is that the Pentagon, and you can Google this, by the way is that it does not undergo rigorous uh, audits, mm. right? And so the 10% cut, what it does is that it, 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 it targets the waste, okay. right? That's okay. what it does, right? <clears throat> and so in a, in a budget cut would be 10%. Now, that 10% cut would not touch a dime that's coming to Ukraine, mm. not a dime. And for those of you who really follow this stuff, there is a massive issue with waste in the Pentagon, none of that would stop our readiness to defend America. Right. It wouldn't stop our readiness to support countries like Ukraine and our allies. It would just cut from the, the wasteful spending that is not efficiently used. And that could go to taking care of America, yeah, yeah, taking yeah. care of resources, and that's billions of dollars. And so when I say that we don't have a resource issue, we have an allocation issue, we have an auditing issue, we're not spoken to that way because we think that the American public does not have the intellectual bandwidth yeah. to understand the nuances of how government works, right? And you know, and we talk about the U.S. budget the way that we talk about our own pocketbooks, right? And it's a vast, that's, that's so... and, it's, and it's vastly different, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, and, and both parties don't do it properly. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I think just not talking to the American people like they're stupid. Yeah, it's fundamental. Sorry. Now, fin I'll finish, man, by saying that. We really, we, the moral issue is that we have to stop speaking, and this is usually Republicans, you know, particularly the MAGA crowd. Yeah. And, 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 you know, one, there is this contingency in the Republican Party that's just spread like a cancer that has turned every world issue like Ukraine, because you know it was the border, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, we got to protect the border. Now it's, we got to start, we, gotta, we, we have to stop thinking about Ukraine and putting America first, first right? Yeah. And, and what's ironic 
about this is that, again, it's all based in white supremacist language and that these people, the Republican Party, which control large swaths of the American South, have used this language about taking care of the homeland. And they're some of the poorest states in the union, which yeah, I yeah. find ironic. I'm going to take you to the opposite end of the spectrum now. Yeah. And it's very busy on Kershattuck. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, ironically, you had just gotten into it on your Twitter. Or not really into it, but you had quote tweeted this organization. Uh, code, oh, code Pink. Code, yeah, Code <laughs> Pink. Uh, peace, <laughs> peace Grifters, as you coined them. Yeah, uh, they are. Yeah. Well, talk about it, bro. What is, what is that? What is going on there? Okay, I didn't even think about... I see Cold Pink and I've watched Cornell West. Here's the thing. I've, I actually have interviewed Cornell West and oh, really? I looked up to him. I'm actually writing one of my first, uh, my first newsletter article is going to be written about, right? I'm going to focus on him and Cold Pink. Okay. These people have no power. Mm. So they're not going to, they don't have any influence in the wall and, and you know, on the, in the chambers of, of, of Congress so or anything like that. Yeah. But here's the problem. Okay. What, what bothers me about them is that they use this framework of peace. And I usually don't respond to anything that they say or do, but it just got to me, and particularly with Cornell West, and what, I think that they're intellectually fraudulent. Mm. So that's, it's intellectual fraudulence. So let me tell you what that means. I've interviewed Cornell West a number of times, and I uh, sat down with him for a while, and I actually legitimately responded Respected him, right? And I, I've been following him uh, for decades because he wrote a book in the early, late, like late 1990s or early 2000s called Race Matters. Mm. All right. And by the way, I'm 43 years old. So I'm kind of, hey. yeah, 40, 43 years old. So I, that's what I'm saying. I can go back a couple <laughs> decades, right? And go back to my college days. But I, um, I followed this work for a while and he talked about the structures of racism and things like that. And I really, and, and it's a really great, really great book for the, you know, public consumption. And so what bothers me about it is that he can talk about Palestine and Palestinian liberation, which is what I also support. Yep. Um, so if we could talk about apartheid in Israel and all these other things, if you have, if, if you could talk about the liberation of people in South America, talking about, you know, white supremacy in the United States, why is it that you have this absence of justice for Ukrainians? This country has undergone centuries of Russian colonialism. Mm. Centuries. And I also find it odd that he had any all the work that he and Cold Pink do. Where are the Ukrainians? Okay, and, 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 and here's and the thing is, is that I know a lot of socialists yeah. here in Ukraine. They see him as an accomplice to Putin. Mm. So you so so he likes to talk about being able to go into the lion's den and talking to anybody. He's not here. Their groups are not doing any humanitarian work. They're not doing, they're not with you. They're not supporting your work. No. So I just found them to be, I just, I mean, sir, I mean, yeah. I just find them to be fraudulent. Yeah, bro. Because they, and they talk about peace, but they don't have, they're not protesting at the embassy, Russian embassies in no. the United States. They're not protesting at the consulates. And a lot of the stuff that, and that's the reason why I did that thread. A lot of the stuff that they're advocating for has been in process, has been tried. There are, Turkey is hosting peace summits in Istanbul as we speak. Now, yeah. the definition of peace, you know, Zelensky had his peace agreement, which is get the fuck out of Ukraine, right. essentially, right? And so all the things that they're talking about have been done. And I really am troubled by this black man who talks about white supremacy, which is something that I agree with, and something that you acknowledge that happens in our country, yet he chooses to be aggressively blind to the genocide that's happening here. And he has his very theological base 
um, you know, and I, I go to a black liberation theology church, I'm, you know, Baptist, you know, in Brooklyn, New York. And we both understand the work of James Cone, who was the, the, the founder of black liberation theology. And so what troubles me is that his theology doesn't extend here. What he's doing is he knows that with his rabbit, particularly small rabbit base, challenging anything that's not American imperialism or American colonialism doesn't work well with their base. And I think that he's being selfish and he's strategically not engaging Ukraine mm. or Ukrainians or working with them because he knows that he won't be president. But what he can do is gain popularity with this base of people. And I don't know exactly why he's not doing it, but I just know that it's morally bankrupt. And that's what bothers Bad me. Facts, and, morally and, and, bankrupt. And, and, yeah. and that's what bothers me. Yeah, because man. again, I've interviewed this man. And I know that he is smart enough mm -hmm. to understand Russian colonialism which only makes me conclude that he is strategically not engaging it because it would not be politically expedient for his purposes. And I just find that unacceptable. Absolutely. And you had said it too. Like, I, I actually, ironically, Code Pink was speakers often at some BLM rallies in 2020. So I actually platformed their, their speeches. and, and, and Sure. And not, yeah, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of people. Some I mean, journalism. Fine, so fine, it, it, fine. it bothered me right away. Like, I'm like, I was out there with you and you were talking about the police brutality and the genocide in the streets. And like, I understood the messaging. I understood what was being said. But then it's like when it came to Ukraine, the immediate like hypocrisy that I, I just... I didn't, I didn't understand. But, but you know another thing, too. When we're so look, here, here's another thing. And this, is, this goes beyond Cold Pink. Okay. And I'm saying this as addition to being a think tank per person. I'm going to be joining a think tank out. I oh. can't make the announcement right now. But basically, I consider myself to be progressive. I consider myself to be, you know, very liberal leaning. Um, but here's the thing. Foreign policy and dealing with the real structures of how to address it is really messy. Mm. This world is very, very messy. And in order for us to really deal with these very complex issues, we cannot be, um, what's the word? I mean, I'm, there's a word that I have. It's, uh, we cannot be, um, um, I'm, I have to say the word. Complacent? No, 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 that's, that's definitely not it. We can't be, um, um, we, we can't be so stringent in our mm -hmm. politics that we're inflexible, mm -hmm. right? And so what do I mean by that? Mikhail Gorbachev presided over some of uh, the worst policies of Ukraine across the Soviet Union, et cetera, right? You know, um, but he also created opportunities for really effective policy to, um, to cut down on nuclear weapons arsenals, right? Um, when you think about the clerk in South Africa, same thing, you know, it was a big part of shutting down the nuclear program in South Africa, right? Um, Reagan, great Soviet policy, mm. domestically, racism, all this other Not stuff, good. right? We, we get it. But what I'm saying is that we have to be intellectually nimble mm. enough to kind of find that little, even if it's a narrow little avenue yeah. to understand, okay, this person has a point there, so I'm going to ride that. So I think that with West and Cold Pink and a lot of people who think like them is that there's, they want to be so pure in their politics that they're ineffective and that's the problem and i think that we can never be so pure in our politics mm. that we can't be effective and so i will work with any group of people if we can find that one particular area where we can coalesce around but with the cold pink people i just think that they're seeking um political purity yeah and it's selfish and it's and it's an exercise in ego and I, what I hope will happen is that another Ross Perot, I don't have a problem with third parties, but I do have a problem mm -hmm. with our people who have so much ego that they put themselves ahead of a country 
and one or two points that could be shaved away from somebody like Biden um, will go to somebody like Trump. And not only will Ukraine be screwed, we will be screwed. Facts. And explain, could you go into that a little more? Why yeah. is, why is uh, for regular Americans now, like we went kind of with the America First crowd and the Code Pink crowd. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Those, everyone that's kind of like, why is uh, supporting Ukraine, paying attention to Ukraine important for Americans? Okay, so why is it important for Americans? We're in a NATO alliance, right? So uh, we, we need to explain what do our alliances mean. Mm -hmm. And, and if you are in a, an alliance, which means if you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us, you can't just think about your alliance issues. You have to think about the fact that Ukraine borders Poland, it borders Romania, Slovakia, um, you know, it borders, you know, Hungary. Okay. If you're thinking purely from a strategic standpoint, from a security standpoint, it's troubling to have Russia destabilizing a country that's on your border. From a security standpoint, yeah. that just can't happen. Right. Okay. And it's important for Americans to understand that if you're in a, an alliance, we have to have, like we need to have a communication with the American people about our responsibility to our allies. Here's the bottom line. If you don't want that responsibility, ask yourself, do you want to be in the alliance? Mm. That's the, let's just be straight up about it. Mm. But if you're in the alliance, you're in it. Facts. Okay? But because we're in it, we can't give ourselves this convenient out. Right. This is a country, Russia is destabilizing Ukraine. It is on our border. And Ukraine is our ally. We've been, NATO's been training Ukrainian, the Ukrainian military since 2007, 2008. We have a responsibility to protect them, which is sending arms, right? And, we, and so with, and another thing is that ultimately this is going to be become our problem anyway because you think about the refugee crisis, you think about, you know, because there are millions of people who are going into Poland. Poland is cutting off its support to us by a certain percentage because they, they are not they haven't they weren't prepared to become a well to, to become an ex extended welfare state for millions of ukrainians and that doesn't mean that they don't want to support it it's just that their budget is severely overwhelmed and that's a legitimate concern so we all are 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 are, are consuming this responsibility rightfully yep. right we and we should right but it would be better if we just gave ukraine as much military aid as possible so they can kill as many soldiers as possible so they can eliminate this problem facts okay so so that's ultimately what it comes down to so even if we don't send any aid it's still going to become our issue and we're not no one talks to us about this mm -hmm. because we're not communicated to about what it means to be a global citizen we're global citizens we are look we are the the president of the association of global leadership mm -hmm. if you will if you look at it that way we have this responsibility whether we want it or not, okay? And, and, and another problem is that with our State Department, our State Department is severely underfunded. I'm not going to get into the weeds of that, but I'm, I bring it up because if America, the way that our country is set up economically and politically, we can't start the responsibility. The yeah. problem is that we're, we're, poor, we're under communicated to and I think that if we were better communicated to as citizens about these issues, we'd be better off. Now, another thing I want everyone to think about, right? We're entering another presidential election. Yeah. When was the last time that we've had a substantive conversation about foreign policy? I'm not just talking about military because defense is different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you want your world to function? When have we had a conversation about African politics? We never talk about the continent of Africa, no. right? And, and so, and there's an intersection with the continent of Africa here when you think about brain, you think about all these other issues. The American brain has the capacity to engage these issues, but we aren't. And so when you don't engage people, that muscle isn't working. It's not that we're stupid. Yeah, yeah. No one talks to us about it. No right. one tells us that we should be thinking about this along with everything else. And, and as the only lone superpower, 
I just think that it's just a political responsibility that's just been dropped by by both parties. And, and, and we just, and, and overall, uh, our, our elected officials, Biden especially, um, need to do a better job of it. Now, how concerning or, well, you already touched on it earlier, so it is yeah, concerning, yeah, yeah. Uh, is uh, the current situation in the House of Representatives on the uh, trying to cut aid to Ukraine. I know a couple GOP senators have also said that they will not also, that they will do the similar thing as the House if it came to them. Yeah. How, is it concerning or what is Yeah, the, it's, it's, it's definitely concerning because basically, you know, there's, a, you know, uh, here's the reason why it's concerning. Short term, long term. Short term, it, it's my understanding, and I may be wrong. So that's what I'm saying. Uh, don't quote me. I think that Ukraine aid is good throughout the rest of the year. The problem is 2024. Um, but the problem is that the you 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 basically have eight or nine people that are holding Ukraine a hostage. That's a primary problem because the, the, the Republicans have a slim majority. They have about six yeah. more members or something like that, six or seven. But you basically have about eight people who are pretty much, and, and, and you know, ironically, it wasn't Marjorie Taylor Greene or all these other people who voted to oust McCarthy, right? Yeah. Um, but, or, 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 or Lauren Boebert, those, those yahoos, right? But, 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 but basically what you have is this using ukraine as a as a uh as a as a campaign rallying point because here's the thing people are talking about ukraine but it's, but domestically taking money from ukraine cutting aid has nothing to do with ukraine none of these people give a damn about ukraine it's about it's about political expediency for themselves so it's just another america first tool mm -hmm. Because nothing that they're talking about deals with security. It doesn't deal with policy. It doesn't deal with strategic. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't deal with uh, regional st uh, strategy. They don't talk about any of that stuff. They just say we need more money for, this, for America. And I just explained earlier to you that it's not about, re it's not about resources. Less than 4% of our defense budget is coming to Ukraine. It's not about money. So this, so the whole premise of why they want to cut aid to Ukraine is false. It's not true. No one is communicating this to the American people in any meaningful way. It's concerning because if Jim Jordan is 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 selected and Trump has oh, endorsed Jesus. him, yeah, if he's yeah. if he's selected, and I think there's a pretty he, good chance that you he you think he will become yeah, the yeah. speaker. Oh, it, it's it's going to be a big problem. Now the <sighs> Senate has certain you know uh, 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 levers. You know they're the higher uh, chamber, and and there are things that Biden can do unilaterally. But <clears throat> the the but the but but a, but a Republican House that's really resistant to aid will definitely plug the hole because Europe doesn't have the uh, the coffers uh, to necessarily do it itself. So I'm definitely troubled um, because this is uncharted territory. And here's another yeah, thing, long, long, long term, I think that there's a good possibility that the Democrats could take over the House. However, however, I think there are, there are several dozen Senate races uh, that's taking place and the Democrats can lose yeah. the Senate and more and, 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 and really more critically Trump has a good chance of reclaiming the White House if no one thinks that Trump can win you're lying to yourself so the ne so I know we're thinking about now but I'm also thinking about November oh, bro, where, so, where, where you so have so, so where yeah. you have all these issues yeah. Right, because there is a good, <clears throat> and there thing, and there's a good chance that both chambers and the, and the White House could go back to Republicans. That that's a real reality here, and what that means for Ukraine is that you're not going to have the senior leadership of a Joe Biden. That's that's pretty much the whip of NATO. So, I know for 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 those of you who who who, who follow, you know, Congress. You know, you have the whip mm -hmm. that's in the house, for example, right? 
pretty much rallies all the votes. Yeah. people in the, You know, yeah. Joe Biden was, is that for NATO and the rest of the world. He's the person that goes to, that goes to Berlin. Hey, yeah. you know, we'll send our, we'll send our leopards, you know, we'll, we'll send our, um, our Abrams. Okay, we'll be we forced to send our leopards. That, that, that type of thing, right? Same thing with France. Trump is not going to do that. No. Right? Now, the Senate is a bit more ideologically sane. Yeah. Right? It, even on the, on the Republican side. Yeah. But, you know, the way that districting, just districting is set up in, in, in the United States, I mean, hell, a, a, a damn ferret can, can get elected. Yeah, right? So, so I'm, I'm terribly <laughs> concerned. And I think a lot, you know, I had a couple of my Ukrainian friends, some of them that work in, 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 in um, politics here saying Terrell what do you think is happening and, and I hope they're listening here I'm it's it's not good and I hate and I wish I could deliver better you mean, news. It's, 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 it. it's not good at all because Jim Jordan will definitely for the sake of political expediency definitely um, vote to strike down aid and and I just fear um, that Europe won't pick up the slack what will be the repercussions of this Ukraine, you know, we they'll run out, run, they'll, they'll they'll run out of missiles. I mean, think, man, look, we we are entering the winter. Yeah, yeah, it's getting it's getting colder. It, it's it's getting colder, and boy, I think that Ukraine will be better prepared to deal with the missile strikes against the energy system now. Yeah, but Jesus Christ, man, um, I'm just worried about us having enough. Um, you know, just 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 having enough ammunition for um, you know, and, and I'm sorry, my brain is going there for the uh, the, the Patriots. Yeah, the Patriots. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, for Patriots and yeah. all these other things. You know, and I know that for, uh, Spain has approved, you know, the um, yep. off systems and things like that. So we're good on that in that regard. But hey, when when those when those munitions run out uh, for uh, for our Patriots, and we don't get any aid, like I, I I'm, I'm and, and here's the thing. That that's a possibility. It's, it's also a possibility that you know the rounds that Ukraine used because this is a this is a heavy um, artillery. Yes, it is. This is a heavy artillery yeah. war. Ukrainians running out of artillery, um, and I'm concerned about how long Ukraine will be able to hold out at that point because the thing about Russia, and there's a larger picture here. This is what happens when you have a case like Russia where the state controls society and in the United States where society controls the state. Mm. What we're witnessing in the United States is the consequences of a very racist, white supremacist element of our society is able to elect, the peop elect officials who elect officials who are so devoted to their white supremacy not only is it hurting america it's hurting the rest of the world because that's where it's coming from i, I want I'm, i want you know ukrainians this is what i explain to them ukraine is being used for this for this maga yeah. revolution that at the end of the day it affects ukraine it has everything to do with their security but in the larger domestic u.s picture it's not about ukraine at all right and there's a difference and the ramifications uh what i also fear is that Europe is is also dealing with its own right wing yeah, elections, yeah. right? You know, and it seems similar too to the energy, at least. In some right. Places. I mean, but that's the whole thing. All, but but it's all for the very same reason. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Le Pen in France, when the next election comes, I think that she has a damn good chance of winning because she keeps trying. Yeah. And she keeps trying, yeah, <laughs> trying. Yeah. Right. And then you know when, when you look at Slovakia, yeah, what's yeah. happening right here today, right? But but Orban is i think is a as a peer of donald trump in many respects too right and so i i, I worry about ukraine and its ability you know the ramifications because the, the 
their, their military is highly dependent on our productions. And then not only that, too, there's also production of, of, um, of those 155 millimeter rounds, 120 millimeter, millimeter rounds. All of this is the effort of Joe Biden saying, hey, we need to get production up, right? Do I really think that, I mean, that still can happen, but in the grand scheme of things, we have somebody like Jim Jordan that's just gonna throw a monkey wrench behind everything. Do I think that that aid, those aid packages uh, will be approved, even if they're reduced, won't be enough? Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm, I think that there are repercussions from this that are so bad that we can't even predict them. And I think that's how bad it will get because it's uncharted territory. A hundred percent. Yeah, man. All right, y'all. Let's do viewer questions yeah. uh, for Terrell. Uh, if you were, if you already had asked him, just re-ask if you guys could. I'm gonna give you guys a weather report while we're waiting, yeah, and you guys yeah. can ask some questions. We this is like a part of our stream. Cool. It's 52 degrees and partly cloudy Fahrenheit, which would be like what? Uh, 15, 15. 15 Celsius ish. I think so. Somewhere around there. I'm the, still learning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the teens. yeah. It, it's chilly. It's a it's a brisk, uh, blustery fall day. It's gonna get to a high of 60 degrees, and it looks like you're not gonna hit 70 again until next Thursday. So it's gonna be in the 50s and the 60s here in Ukraine. I think it's also getting uh, chillier back home. Back in Minnesota, it was like 90 degrees for like last weekend. It was like 90, and now it's back down to like uh, to like 50. Yeah, a couple months is gonna be it's gonna be. Negative five. All right, I uh, got uh, you, me. <laughs> oh, for real. I'm yeah, not right. I'm not, I am not ready for that. Um, so, Richard, thank you so much for the memberships. Just me, a little help. Thank you, MR Brute, and then MR Brute. Vladinator says, with 500 Australian, thank you, Terrell Star. You're an amazing, and your reporting has been higher quality than mainstream media. Thank you. Andrew, thank you for Mercado Media. You're inspirational and amazing asset to the community, and you're doing a great job. Thank you so much, Vlad. Continuing your awesome independent journalism, though today is hard, tomorrow will be better because you are a good person. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Vladinator. Now, I had, one, I had someone ask, uh, what's your uh, opinion on China and the geopolitical Thanks. Okay, so one of the things I do a good job of is I tell people when I don't know something, I don't follow China well enough to really give you a sophisticated mm, education, a, a educated uh, uh, opinion on that. I can speak generally. Uh, the problem is that. So the, the can I ask yeah, the question. Yeah. The, yeah. So the, so it just uh, so the question was. Um, I'm trying to. Uh, how does Terrell feel about China and their role in the wider world? In the world, the wider world. Okay, I get it. Yeah. So. I think. There are ways in which China, the way that China moves is, and I think about Af the continent of Africa, yep. they do a lot of infrastructure projects, right? Because their main resource is people. And so, I mean, it's a country of 1 1.5, 1 1.8, it's a huge number. And so, China is playing a very different long game that's, that's, that's based on human resources. And I think the problem with America, there are a couple things. Do I see them as a geopolitical threat? Yeah, but in the sense that we ourselves are not adequately invest, investing in our own diplomacy. Uh, of demonstrating why we as America will be a better alternative mm. to authoritarian China. So our marketing needs to get better on our bonds. marketing needs to get better, but our but our politics yeah, bro. need to get better and our diplomacy. And I mentioned earlier about our dearth of diplomacy with our U.S. State Department, it's severely underfunded. Um, we don't, ha you know, China has a very, the thing about China is that their leadership structure rarely changes. I mean, they can have a foreign minister that stays in power for 15 years or 20 years. And think about how many leaders that they've had, right? So these type of authoritarian states, what they have it to their advantage is that they can have a leader that lives for 30 years. And so the policy doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the United States, we have elections every four every years. Every four years, years the policy So I think, so, so, at the very basic level, we're not going to be able to compete against their consistency. What we have to do as a society in America is build a, a society 
where we have a shared value system regardless of the party. And until we're able to do that, we're not going to be able to go on the world stage with a consistent policy because our, you know, because our values shift from MAGA yeah. to Tea Party oh, really? to whatever you name, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that's the fundamental issue, but I don't want to delve too deep into it because I'm not a child. That's, like, that's like a whole nother, yeah, that's yeah, like a yeah, whole yeah, nother yeah. topic. Oh, where did uh, Terrell get that Rick and Morty coffee cup? <laughs> they can see. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even notice it. So I, that's listen. funny. They can see by his shirt in the bottom. Man. Okay, so <laughs> I got this from some place around the corner. Really? Yeah, I got it from around the corner. So I bear, I, I got yeah around the corner. U Ukraine's got a thing for brands. They like uh, um, American TV shows. Yeah, exactly. I literally went to uh, in on the left bank. There's a Friends Cafe, bro. It's Friends themed. Well, yeah, it's on the. I'll send you the location. It's, it's friends themed. It's they got the whole logo of it and everything. It's. I feel it's like a, it's a cafe. <laughs> really? Yeah, bro. Okay. I gotta show you. Um, can you ask Terrell how do we effectively fight? I'm just gonna misinformation. Misinformation. Yeah, yeah. You fight misinformation by bringing on real information mm. as a start. I know it's very basic, but it's very real. Um. But then also, I'm, as this is a really good question, I, and I'm really passionate about this. So, and I have a story. Oh, okay. So, prior to social media, and I'm speaking particularly of the United States, because we're the, we're the media market of the world, particularly New York City, but basically, you had the major networks and New York Times, Washington Post, your local newspapers, and they were the disseminators of information. And they had, and, and so, when we got news, it primarily came through trained journalists, which is a good thing. With social media, I don't think that social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, you name it, really saw themselves as media companies. I think they saw themselves as social media, right? And so it ballooned into uh, these platforms where, where, where we are uh, producing content that's legitimate news. I mean, you know, you all came to know me through my Twitter account, all right? So the problem is that you don't have responsible people like you, like you or me. Everyone is using that constitutional right to spread their information. But these social media companies don't have editors, don't have fact checkers right. to curb it. Right. And that's the and, 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 and that's the problem. And not only that, the American public, especially, has not been trained on media literacy. Right. And that's the pri and that's the primary problem. And so we aren't conditioned to understand, OK, whose blue check do we trust and not trust? Because with social media platforms now, they're selling the blue check. So it's not. So I was one of those blue checks that. I had to be vigorously checked for, you know, whatever, right? And I yeah, started yeah, because yeah. I worked at a news, sta a news yeah. organization and I was a uh, correspondent covering the 2016 election, right? And so the blue check doesn't mean anything anymore. Right. And when you have millions of people spreading information and the social media platforms are not adequately designed to check it, that's a problem, right? And then so until that reverses, it's going to be really challenging Final story, because I have to say it, and I know it's a long question, but it's really, I think it's really important. So, covering the 2018 midterms, I was in Georgia covering the Stacey Abrams uh, election. So I was down there for months, mm -hmm. going from one little country town to the next. I went to one rally for Stacey, little black town of 200 people. And this guy, this guy, brown skin guy comes in with a, make uh, with a MAGA hat on. Mm -hmm cause a little ruckus, whatever. I decided, let me go talk to this guy. Come to find out, he's a gay guy from Colombia who joined the Navy. And I'm like, okay, this okay. is interesting, right? Yeah, it's getting, <laughs> right, it's right, getting right. more interesting. Yeah. And so I said, I just, I was just, we had general conversation. Then out of the blue, he talks about trans people. I'm like, where the hell is this coming from? Right. You know, because, you know, it just came out. The blue. It's just like this talking he, about he Ukraine. And, he, and, and, then, and then I'm just like, you know, I have an issue with these trends. Out of nowhere. You know yeah, what I'm saying, like, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I said, okay. Um, and he said, well, 
I don't support trans people getting surgeries because it's costing us billions of dollars in, in military spending. I'm like, okay. Number one, that's false. Right. Just fl flat out wrong. Okay, yeah. your number is just flat out wrong. Right. And I know this because I cover military budgets. Mm. So I said, okay, where'd you get this information from? I said, besides being a transphobe, okay? Right, right. <laughs> start on that let, point. Let's just start that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But your number is wrong. So he said, no, it's not. I said, okay, tell me where you got it from. So I literally gave him my phone, show me. Yeah, yeah. And I walked him. And so he said, okay, I got this. So he started at Breitbart. I said, okay, let's look at your Breitbart number. Let's look at this number. So you started at Breitbart? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, oh, so, nice. I, so I, show, I said, okay, show me. And I said, well, show me the figure. Oh, jeez. I said, let's click through. Then it was uh, Fox News. Oh, I think geez. it was Fox. No, at first it was Fox News and it was Breitbart. And then I said, okay, here's the thing. They took a number and it's the number... The number was smaller than what he said, but the, even the number that these Breitbart used was misconstrued. So I said, okay, let me walk you through it. Here's the real number. Mm -hmm. So what you said, and, and, and the thing is, most people don't take the time to go to these little boring, very, you know, these, 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 very, these very specific offices inside of an office, inside of an office in, in, in the Department of Defense, right? So I said, here's the real number. Why did you believe this? Because most of these disinformation artists know that you're not going to take the time to do the work that I'm doing with you. Right. And so, you know, and so that's my, yeah, so, so yeah, that's yeah. my whole point yeah, of yeah. bringing this up. And so that's the issue of disinformation. Right. And misinformation, right, is that most people are not going to do the work of clicking through and clicking through and clicking through because they're tapping into your fears and what you want to right. believe. And that's and that's the thing about social media. When you, when you have a monetized uh, structure that's based on getting clicks as opposed it's to feeding, sending real it's information, feeding you. it's feeding you. So yeah. you're dealing with the so you're dealing with an ethical dilemma here that our country has not really dealt with. And I honestly think it's going to come down to it being regulated. But that's another conversation. Absolutely. I had to share that story because I thought it, it requires It's a great time. answer, too. And it's wild. I mean, growing up in the I'm a millennial, so I grew up yeah. in the in the Internet age, like as it was a newborn baby to where it is now, mm -hmm. like literally from like I, from the start. And even through school, like Wikipedia was evil, like the Internet was still evil, kind of like don't trust the Internet. Been, and there's a definitely not don't trust everything you see on the internet yeah. but also you can use the internet as a tool we use it all we, yeah we're i use using it, we're it, now. Using it now exactly right. yeah. yeah perfect point so yeah media literacy and like i've expanded my media literacy too we all have to yeah we have it's to. it's impossible not to yeah I, it's it sometimes it just takes going to like a few more sources and just checking the, the your, you, you can still have your favorite source but like sometimes you got to check the other ones too to verify that you're still getting the correct absolutely info. man yeah yeah that's what I've learned. All right, let's do a few more, you guys. Yeah. Um, uh, you want to tackle this one? Where is it? As an American of African descent, any racism in Ukraine? Thank you for that question. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I'll tell <laughs> So <laughs> here's the thing, you know, yes, I've experienced it. So here's the thing what's interesting about racism in Ukraine. Like I, 90 five percent of my experience here is really good but the five percent like sucks yeah. and so I'll give you an example the first time i came here like 2000 like when i was getting an apartment 2009 july i hired a real estate agent to get me a apartment so i so they picked me up from the airport like two o'clock in the afternoon, whatever, I come in and I had the, all the money, first four months rent, whatever, paid for or whatever. They drove me, you know, then they picked me up and they, and the guy told me, he extended his hand, he said, hey, Terrell, your skin color is giving us a lot of problems. <laughs> Straight up, just like, wow. Yeah, God, because, it, because they wouldn't rent to black people and for all the obvious stereotypes and so i had to go around from house to house to house to house to house to house to house, to house until one and you know and, and, and the whole story lasts throughout the evening and when i had my yeah you know it's, it was a whole story but yes now and then at that time police officers or racially profiling people it was really bad right and, and it was uh there'd be time i i got stopped so many times 
I, the number of times I got stopped that I, that I kept counting of was 30. And it's more because I just stopped counting at 30. Wow. Um, and, and, and now here's the thing. The, the country has improved significantly. But also keep in mind that I'm a black American and I'm not local. And so, and that's a whole nother conversation because I do a lot of work. I have a lot of black Ukrainian friends. I have a lot of African friends. I know people who've been here for 30 years. One of the stories that I'm doing uh, for my YouTube channel and my newsletter is going to be focusing on black people who live here. And wow. it's a wide yeah. range of experiences. But yes, I have dealt with racism here. Now, now uh, broadly, I would say, like I enjoy living here. Like it's great. Um, and I feel completely comfortable. I feel completely safe, you know, from that perspective. And I, I have such, I have a huge social life. But yeah, the, ra the racism was worse years ago. And obviously, I told you about the work I'm doing with the, you know, with Africans who fled. So it's an issue here. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, but I'll also acknowledge that Ukraine, uh, the issues of racism here is no different than any other part of the world, mm. including the United States of America. That is, <laughs> it, that that that's on that's that's on course to possibly uh, elect a white nationalist. In the U.S., we uh, monetize it and platform it. We're out where they're yeah, loud yeah, about yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Can you ask him what had the most impact on on you in Ukraine? What's what's impacted you the most while you've been here? Um, the most impact that I have seen here is that's another good question. I, you know, I feel like this is a calling. I feel like you, what you're doing, is a calling. Because yeah. this experience, we're going to be here, uh, you know, this is something that we will all be able to talk about for the rest of our lives, man. Um, I, number one, I just fundamentally love this place. I love living here, uh, which is why I'm going to be here over the next couple of years. So uh, I'm going to be spending, up, prior to, I was spending six months here. Now I'm just going to be living here for the vast majority of the year. No, okay. I love it. But the biggest impact is... This, I, I saw the, the best of people during this war. I saw the worst people, but, but at the end of the day, it, it gives me hope that even when, when Ukraine is, is going through right now, they're experiencing this genocide, they're experiencing constant bombings, uh, shelling, uh, missile strikes, and I've run into so many people who want to build. And so the last question dealt with racism, which is a very real thing. But I've also run into our people who say, you know what, I'm Ukrainian and I don't stand for that. I've had people, I raised some money for a black Ukrainian woman who was in a bit of a crisis. And I want to thank, if you're listening and if any of you gave, thank you very much. And I responded to everybody on PayPal who gave. but. I had Ukrainians reach out to me and say, well, Terrell, thank you very much. And I think that this society has a great deal. You know, I, I see so much hope. Um, I'm building with Ukrainians who want to build solidarity with other oppressed people across the world. I, I have a lot of Ukrainian friends who are traveling to the continent of Africa to learn and to grow. And so when I talk about Ukraine that I know, I talk about these people. Mm because those are the people that you can build yes. with. And the, you know, and so I acknowledge the challenges, but I, but I also want to amplify and platform the builders. And so those are the most impactful things because for all the ne negative things I experience, I see so many of these people who are doing the very difficult work as they're going through a occupation and a genocide. And that's the Ukraine that I want people to come away from when they look at my content. Absolutely. Yeah, well, man. Another independent journalist, Philip Itner, is in the chat, and he says, in his personal experience, uh, Ukrainians are aware of their racism and want to improve things. Is that what you can you say you've seen that similar, or could it be Half and half. <laughs> uh, half and half? <laughs> okay, so I know Philip. What's up, Philip? So, so here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just, so I'm usually, I, 
I'm a very unique situation because not only am I just a black person that's here, my career focuses on the race. Mm, I cover it yeah, in the yeah. United States and I cover right. it in Europe. Yeah. And so that's the whole thing. So I, so I cover it in Ukraine. So I'm uniquely positioned to talk about it. Right. Right. I see, and, and, I see exactly. And, you know, what you mean. and usually, and because there are not a lot of black people who live here regularly, who come here, who understand the languages, like, I'm usually the first black person that a lot of Ukrainians interact with. And also keep in mind that there are a lot of Ukrainians who go over to America who don't really socialize with black people because they integrate into the white society because in America, Ukrainians are white and they just integrate into that. And so I'm the first person that they have any legitimate conversation around race with. And so going back to that question they want to change, I run into a lot of people who are aggressively ignorant and it becomes so, you know, like I've had to really be an ambassador and I've had to bite my tongue. Mm -hmm. I've had to really, in a lot of cases, because I'm educating people through You're their ignorance. You're trying to change minds. You're trying to change And minds. it's extremely frustrating. And there are some days where I don't have the emotional bandwidth to deal with yeah. it because it's just me. And I have to be that ambassador for so many people that I don't mind doing it, but what I do mind are the people who are aggressively ignorant, especially the Ukrainians who go to the United States. They have one bad experience with black people and that becomes their standard. And what I usually do is say, my first day in Ukraine, I dealt with housing discrimination. Mm. If I could be the perfect Russian bot and perfect Russian propagandist, because I had really real experiences, but do I do that? No. Mm. So just as I've given your country and your people an opportunity, a benefit of the doubt and not painting them with this broad brush, please have the same respect for my people and my and i've had to do that with and i do that conversation i have that conversation mm. once a month how does that go how does that go usually do they like does it hit them or it like, hits them yeah yeah. it hits them <laughs> it hits them but here's the thing right it hits them but i have to sit with myself because There are times when I just want to cuss people out. Yeah, yeah. But this is my calling, and I pray. And I'm being facetious, but I'm serious. Because here's, a, you know, this is a calling. And I think the reason why I have the patience to do it is because it's a calling. Yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so my goal is to build solidarity movements. And this is the country where I'm doing it, besides the fact that I love it. And I believe that if you have a calling, then you're equipped with all the tools that you need in order to deal with the challenges that come along with it. And one of those challenges, Philip, is dealing with Ukrainian people who don't understand their racism. So it's about half and half, Philip. About half and half. About half and half. I want to just uh, give a little anecdote too, <laughs> to add to that so it's not uniquely a Ukrainian. Yeah, um, yeah, when yeah. I served in the U.S. military, I went mm -hmm. to basic training. And that was there was, there was white Americans that were serving that had never seen mm. a, a black person before. Yeah, they yeah. openly said, because we like straight up, like we, we had a, like a coming to Jesus moment where um, some of my friends were like, have you ever seen a black person before? And they were like, no, we haven't. Because they were like, they That's were. Right. They, so to Americans, it's not just like uniquely Ukrainian. I've true. Seen, uh, I've, yeah, that's true. I've seen Absolutely. this directly in the United States. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's 100 percent true. I like the question. Yeah, yeah, me too. Can you, can you ask Terrell what the popular arts and culture scene is like in Ukraine oh regarding regarding diversity and inclusion? Oh, diversity and inclusion. So there's a woman. Um, Alex Zerobal, who does a lot of work on this. Uh, and you will, if you go to my Twitter and you go into the, the media, you'll see that here. Um, it's growing and, emer and, and, and it's um, emerging. So I'm going to, there's a number of meanings in that question, so I'm going to tackle it the best yeah, way yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, 
but some in some of my photos when people see the black art on my walls a lot of people don't know that ukrainians are the ones that painted it <laughs> oh, really? really yeah so my favorite artwork like some of my favorite artwork my black artwork is created by ukrainians and one woman is a uh is a is a ukrainian woman who lived in occupied Donetsk. Okay, wow. Right? Wow, wow. And so she just likes painting all kinds of people. And there's this woman in, in um, there's this uh, woman in Lviv who only paints black people. Mm. And one of my friends thought that she was black because the painting was so good. <laughs> really? Yeah, but she's just this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you see a Ukrainian woman walking yeah. down the street. <laughs> yeah, and she only paints black people. And, and so that's one thing, but that subject is emerging. Yeah, you know, in Ukraine, you know, and uh, and so it's growing, and so I'm still learning about it. So I can't really give you an expansive answer, but there are s small groups of people who are doing the work of trying to build inclusion and and diversity. And as I learn more about it, I'll share it with you all. Absolutely. Like something I've seen that's just like inclusive is just like the sidewalks where they think they have like a for, for like it's like a sensory thing, like the yellow strip. I think the blind can use it to tap on the sidewalk. Like, it thing, is. like little, thing, little things like that. Yeah, they're growing here. I mean, that's the whole thing about this country, man. I'm happy you talked about the people with disabilities. Like yeah, so because yeah. one of the things um, that Ukraine is uh, it definitely needs to improve on the people have the physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. So so. Um, when you're, because I know this because I was serving this country for, what if I have people who are on crutches or something like that, which Ukraine has to deal with because there are so many people in this country because of the war mm -hmm. who have lost limbs. And you see a lot of that. I mean, just walking around, I know you have it. It's, yeah. it's a common sight, right? Um, and so at the train stations, when you have to get on the train, you know that's that's a tough thing and and the uh, need for more elevators and things but what i am optimistic about is that because this country is entering the european it, it, it's um really working to enter the european union um they're going to have to address they're going <laughs> to have to yeah. have to address these issues anyway because there is one article i saw where the EU is optimistic that uh, Ukraine can enter as early as um, 2030, mm. which is a real possibility. I just saw that, but um, let me see. It's 2000, 2024. That's six years. That would six be. Years. That, I think that's pretty optimistic. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah within, within ten years. Yeah. Within ten, yeah, I think that's pretty optimistic. Listen, I'm, I'm rooting for them. Yeah, but yeah, I, think, yeah. I still think that's optimistic. But <laughs> but, but but at any rate, um, going back to that question, I see some of the same things here. And I, I saw a big change in that, in, you know, this whole arts world after the Maidan in 2014. Because I'm telling you, man, before 2014, this is a different place. Mm. And, and, and the whole arts world around um, centering and promoting um, and, 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 uh, people with disabilities is a part of that. What's your, what's your favorite Ukrainian dish? Oh, uh, you know, I like... This is not really a dish; it's an appetizer. But I like salo. Mm. Yeah, you, yeah, it's ba, ba, good. Banoush. Yeah, it's just basically like a. It's like a grit. It's like grits. Yeah, yeah. But it's not grits. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can have it with mushrooms, or you can have it with bacon. Ooh, bacon in, in there fact, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Banoush. Okay. Right. It's so. Actually, the last barricade, which is one of the best. Which one of the top place. restaurants is right down the street from us. I had my 30th birthday there. Really? Yeah, I turned 30 in July here in Ukraine. Come on, 30. Yeah, bro. Wow, man. Yeah, yeah. 30. What was I doing when I was <laughs> when I was 30 years old? Damn, 30. So I was in 2010. I celebrated my 30th birthday here in Ukraine. Ironic. Yeah, I'm just yeah, thinking yeah. about it. Yeah, 2000. Because I left here. I left. I left in December 2010 on my Fulbright. Yeah, yeah. Right, so I came here when I was 29, and I celebrated my 30th birthday here. Ironic. Ironic. Same. And not, <laughs> not too far from here. Yeah, same. Uh, what's your your favorite spot in in Ukraine? Is it Kiev? Is it the Carpathians? Is it the East? Carpathians. Car nah, so, so there's a place 
near Ushara that I go to is a tiny little village. And it's a place, uh, it, it, the name is Family Green. And uh, it's a, you know, it's a little family owned place. They have a few uh, cottages there. Great views of the Carpathian Mountains. Oh, I'm a man. person who loves rain. Yeah. And so they have balconies and you can see the mountains and the rain and things like that. And so the Carpathians are great. And I love talking about the Carpathians because I'm the tour guide for, for, for a lot of the locals because a lot of Ukrainians have not been to the Carpathians. They, they haven't been there themselves? No. Um, you know, you, the, the, the Carpathians are a different world for a lot of people because even the way that the Ukrainian is spoken is different because there's a lot of Hungarian uh, influence, Romanian, etc. And so, you know, because it was all Austro-Hungarian, mm -hmm. a lot of it, right? So that's definitely my favorite place in Ukraine, the Carpathian Mountains. Cause I like hiking. Yeah, there, bro, I, go, I love hiking. I go every year. I gotta, I gotta go probably next summer um, because it looks like Alaska. Because mm -hmm. I lived in Alaska for four years, uh -huh. and it just the valleys and like because I, I follow some Ukrainians and a couple of uh, actually ironically two of them are in the Carpathians right now and they're taking photos and I'm just so jealous because it looks. Oh, it's, 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 it's breathtaking, and yeah. I think that it's one of those hidden places in Ukraine that once uh, Ukraine wins, yeah. uh, it, it will be one of the top destinations that I'll definitely do my through a tourism company, my tourism company send people to, and I think that it could be one of the best getaways in all of Europe once it, it fully develops. All right, well... I think that's a, a great, yeah, a great, man. great show. Let's uh, Thanks for having me on, of man. Of course, bro. We're gonna. You, are you down to have some breakfast? Are you free this morning still? No, you? I gotta run. You gotta I run. gotta run, bro. So we'll, we'll we'll link up and have a dinner another time. Yeah, we time will. Or yeah, we'll definitely do that. But so, thank you all so much for your support and thank you for having me on the show. Of course. Yeah, and then again, um, next the final, final thoughts you have, bro, or, or yeah, promotions. Fi yeah, final thoughts. So look, first of all, I want to thank everybody and, and you all uh, for supporting this man right here because it, it really takes a lot for somebody to come from the United States to do this work. So I, I appreciate Thank you, you, bro. Thank you. Because there's a lot of us who really want to come here and care, and we all have to come here and support each other. Because it, it takes a special person to do that. And, yeah, you yeah. Are, and you are. You really are, man. And uh, we need more like you. And, if, you know, and I want to support you as well. And thank you for, you know, having me on. Of course, And connecting bro. me with your audience. And so next week, uh, Black Diplomats uh, uh, YouTube channel is going to debut. And then my newsletter, like Diplomats on, on Substack, will debut. And it will be heavily Ukraine-focused. I'll be talking about a lot of foreign affairs subjects. And, um, you know, you all be joining me on this journey as well. And so and then you can all come on Twitter. Uh, I'm Terrell Jermaine Star, And join me on Twitter. And then from there, you'll be able to see, follow me, follow my work. And, and then you'll be able to jump on the YouTube channel as well and, 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 the all, and all of my other platforms. But thank you very much. Of course, and thank you so much for continuing your work here back in the States. Oh, I was going to ask you quick. Yeah. I, I, really quick. I'm going to a Ukraine Action Summit in D.C. at the end of October. Yeah. Any tips about talking to the people on the Hill or... Uh, talking to people. Just, yeah, no, you know, just be yourself, man. Be yourself. Talk, just, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't think that... It, excuse me. Um, don't, don't go in thinking that you need to prepare a speech. You're here. Yeah, yeah. You're doing the work. You have insights that no one else has. Talk about your work. That's all you have to do. Keep it simple. Appreciate it. Keep it simple. Yeah. Thank you so much, Terrell, and thank you for all of your work. Uh, we will have his YouTube channel tagged in this stream, but give it a week or so. So if you're watching this, um, I will put his YouTube channel in there. Follow Terrell on Twitter. The link is already in the description, so you can click that. Follow him immediately because he's uh. going to have some great work coming out. Thank you guys again so much for tuning in to another episode of Good Morning Kiev. We'll have our new NAFO truck here in the next couple days. That's what we do. We fundraise NAFO trucks and I bring them in. So I'll be back again in November. We're going to have another a great episode tomorrow. I'm going to be walking around Kiev, the Podol district, and show you guys what that looks like. And we'll talk to Fumi-san on Sunday. And then I'm dipping out on Monday. And I'll be back in November. Thanks again for tuning in. See you guys in the next one. Slava right. Ukraine. Heroim Slava. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good show, bro. Yeah, man. Good, good conversation. Show.